Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Earl Bellinger and Matt Kaplan with us today. Hello, Earl. Hello, Matt. Hi, Frank. Thanks for having us. Hi, Frank. Good to see you. Well, it's good to see both of you. And thank you both very much for talking about your very lovely article. Uh, today, we'll get into the details of the real paper from the authors themselves. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, and Earl, what's your what's your geolocation? Where are you at? I'm in New Haven, Connecticut. I actually just started as an assistant professor here at Yale, and today was my first day teaching. Ah, okay, very good. <laughs> well, it's I an exciting day. Wasn't about <laughs> black holes and stars. <laughs> <laughs> no, fortunately not. I kept it the same stuff. Very cool. Uh, and Matt, where are you located at? Yeah, I'm in uh, Normal, Illinois. I'm faculty at Illinois State University. The cool. town was actually named after the school. Everybody always wonders about Normal. It was Illinois State Normal University, and then they named the town that. And then the school dropped it from the name. Got it. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so you guys are in the Midwest and east of the USA. So do we have snow on the ground here in January? Yeah. Yeah, yesterday was pretty bad out. Now it's a little bit more tame. Okay. Matt. Yeah, I'm looking out the window at some snow right now. Yesterday was a snow day. Should have been my first day of class, but that has now been pushed to tomorrow. So, haha, oh, uh -huh. right. roll. Snow day. <laughs> and you're in Arizona, Frank? Uh, yeah, so it is January 17th, 2024, as we record this. Uh, and I am in Phoenix, and we definitely have no snow. Uh, <laughs> it does get fairly chilly in the morning these days. We'll get down to somewhere a few degrees above freezing of water. Uh, but then it'll warm up into a very pleasant afternoon. So it's kind of typical Phoenix winter weather. Very cool. Uh, and Matt, we'll start with you. What do you like to do for research? So I have a few interests. I like high density matter in lots of different places. So that's neutron star crusts. Mm -hmm. That's white dwarf cores. And then at some point in the past year or two, I started thinking about microscopic black holes because what's denser than that? And now I work on these like really low mass primordial black holes that that you know could be whizzing around the solar system. Cool. Very nice. And Earl. So I work in the field of astroseismology, so on pulsating stars. And um, in particular, I mean, I like to work on all different types of pulsating stars, ranging from the sun to classically pulsating stars like Cepheids, also red giants, and various other types. And what I really like is to lend the ultra precise constraints we get from stellar pulsations to other fields of astrophysics. Cool. And that's kind of what brought me into this uh, foray into dark matter candidate. Very cool. Very cool. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome article. This one is an APJ. It is open access. It's the open access era people. You can go grab a copy for free. Go get one. Solar evolution models with a central black hole and Earl and Matt, take us away. Yeah, thanks. So the title is a little provocative because you don't really expect there to be a little black hole um, inside the sun. But of course, we'll, we'll get to that. First, I'd like to talk about our uh, amazing team uh, that we assembled. Uh, we managed to get a lot of really great, smart people with varied expertise to work on this um, interesting and fun problem. Cool. Uh, so the first person who I uh, recruited was, of course, Matt, and we worked uh, closely together on this for the past couple of years. Um, and okay. you already know Matt's uh, area of expertise. Um, we also worked with Teo Rayu and Deepika Bolampali, and they're both experts on um, black hole physics. And both of them work on hardcore GR MHD simulations of black okay. holes. So mm -hmm. they, they were sort of our um, go-to experts for the, the real detailed physics of of how black holes creep. Um, Warwick Ball is uh, one of my longest standing collaborators. Cool. Um, we're, he's also an astro seismologist and we work together also with you, Frank, on the Mesa Stellar Evolution Code. Um, but Warwick actually did his PhD thesis on supermassive quasi stars. So supermassive stars that have uh, black holes at their center. So, um, cool. which I only really found out after I started working on this and then I talked to him about it and he's like hey you know I did my PhD thesis on something like this right <laughs> and I was kind of blown away um yeah it's, it's amazing yeah it, it, uh, Cambridge he did that and then Florian Kunal is um I think he's the academic grandson of Stephen Hawking and okay. uh did his PhD with um Bernard Carr and has done his whole career on um primordial uh black holes as dark matter 
Yep. Rob, Rob Farmer is also a fellow Mesa developer. He was a postdoc um, along with me at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, um, where the next co-author, Samuel Domink, um, is director. And uh, so he contributed a lot of numerical expertise. And also, he also uh, led a very nice paper um, last year on the evolution of thorne zitkov objects, which has a sort of similar um, setup. And so that's a, a, a red giant star that has a neutron star at its center. And finally, um, your inconsistent Dow school, or JCD, um, is considered to be the uh, the grandfather of helioseismology and astroseismology, and he also made the standard model of the sun that people use when comparing solar models. And so, um, I, yeah, I, I did my post, my first postdoc with him, and cool. so I, um, yeah, I talked with him extensively about this, and he helped me uh, look into the neutrino calculations and other associated um, things with this problem. And he was extremely skeptical, probably the most skeptical to start with, but then really warmed up to this. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. Well, <clears throat> here we go. So, yeah. <laughs> so, out, I, out. yeah. Thank you. So, I guess um, to start with, uh, I learned about this topic in the first place um, back at a conference memorializing uh, Michael Thompson, who okay. uh, passed away suddenly uh, at I think around fifty years of age. But he he was also a helio and astro seismologist. But he was. Um, PhD sibling of JCD, and uh, he was interested in this problem when he was a student. And so at his memorial conference, Douglas Goff mentioned that he was looking into uh, what happens if you have black holes inside stars. Mm -hmm. And so I asked JCD, what's the deal with that? And he pointed me to this article by Donald Clayton. And you can see in the first sentence of the introduction, the dark matter problem has now become serious. And we cite Clayton. Well, Clayton's article begins with, uh, the solar neutrino problem has now become serious. And then motivated searching for, um, uh, uh, motivated the idea that black holes might be inside stars due to the fact that the sun had uh, discrepant neutrino measurements. Right. And, right. and so, that, you know, that's an exotic solution that we now <laughs> don't recognize as being the reason why we had discrepant um Evolution uh, measurements of uh, solar neutrinos. But Clayton was inspired, of course, by um, uh, Hawking's article. And Hawking, we, we referenced in the first uh, sentence of our abstract, where Hawking was proposing that the sun might have a primordial black hole at its center, supplying some of the solar luminosity. Right. And, and I'll, I'll add a thought to that. That paper that we're mentioning in the introduction is the primordial black hole paper. It's the the like the discovery paper where he's saying that, oh, these these early time fluctuations could produce huge numbers of these tiny black holes, sub-angstrom black holes even, with masses comparable to asteroids or even smaller. And then there's this throwaway sentence where he goes, and by the way, with these dynamical friction estimates, you could get these capture rates, you might have an asteroid masses worth of primordial black holes accumulate at the center of the sun, and this could then destroy white dwarves and neutron stars once their density is high enough to drive really powerful accretion. Yeah. So we're not actually that wacky in proposing this. We're just pulling the same thread that Stephen Hawking and, and Clayton were uh, in the 1970s. Okay, very good. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I guess um, one, one funny bit of history with this uh, with, with us working on this was that Matt and I had met basically um, over a Zoom call like this. And um, I kind of threw out this idea as a random thought, just saying, I think it would be fun to do this, but there's no reason to do it. And then Matt kind of interjected and said, no, this, this is actually a dark matter candidate. And then I learned about his uh, second life as a, a theorist working on primordial black holes and trying to discover them with uh, uh, lunar impacts and other ah, amazing nice. things. I don't know if you want to add some uh, some context to that, Matt. Yeah, I, I can. I'll, since it's not published in AppJ and it's not this paper, I'll make it brief. But uh, these primordial black holes would be really, really numerous. Like as the mass goes down, the number abundance goes up. Right. And so once you get to this asteroid mass window, this 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 22 grams, there's actually order of magnitude a few within Jupiter's orbit at any given time, transiting the solar system. So just like you would expect a, a detector for 
detecting WIMPs to experience the galactic flux of WIMPs. Well, yeah. the solar system is experiencing a galactic flux of these primordial black holes if they exist. And mm -hmm. they can potentially hit the sun and moon and make craters. And those craters are different than regular rocky craters. But that's all we'll say about that. But there's there's lots of interesting possible solar system tests of these, these low mass primordial black holes is sort of the main point and potentially the sun now. Right, cool, very Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Yeah, so I don't know if we wanna go, go to the abstract and, and uh, show some of the um, main points that we make straight away. So sure. um, yeah, I mean, for, for the uninitiated on primordial black holes, the basic idea is that they would form at the very uh, beginning of the universe and they would span a very wide range of potential masses. Mm -hmm. um, so the initial mass function goes from extremely low mass objects, sub asteroid, all the way up to potentially supermassive or even stupendously large um, black holes. Mm -hmm. And um, so obviously we're considering the, the low mass ones to, to accumulate within um, the sun. And uh, as, as we mentioned straight away, uh, it's a candidate solution to the dark matter problem. Um, and an attractive one because it doesn't require us to change um, the known laws of particle physics. Yeah. And so the, the basic premise of our, of our paper is um, we put such a black hole inside of a star and we compute the evolution to see what happens. Okay. Um, and of course we have to assume an accretion model, um, but uh, we open source our code and make it flexible so that people can test out different accretion models and see what observable consequences come out. So nice. what we show, uh, what, what we say in the abstract is, um, I mean, the first thing we looked at is, okay, uh, one basic thing it seems like humanity should know is, um, what is the upper bound on a black hole that could currently exist okay. in the sun, right? right. Um, because if there was one in there and there were observable characteristics, we would be fools to not <laughs> have checked that, right? right. So. <laughs> Uh, so that was like step one was, okay, uh, how does it change the sun and would we be able to tell the difference if it's in there? Right. And basically, um, measurements, uh, current measurements can rule out black holes of the mass up to about the mass of uh, planet Mercury. So if a okay. lower mass black hole is inside the sun, we okay. can't currently detect it. Um, okay. There's measurements we would potentially be able to make that would, that would allow us to bring that mass range lower. But uh, so far, that's, that's the upper bound on a black hole that could be inside the sun. Okay. Um, now, if such an object is in the sun, okay. then um, let's say a, a black hole with the mass of planet Mercury is inside the sun right now. Okay. Then tomorrow, uh, the, the, the characteristics of the sun would start to change. In particular, okay. um, it would first dim over a very long, time span as uh, accretion onto the black hole starts to be the dominant energy source of the star. Nuclear right. reactions shut off, neutrino flux goes down, right. and then eventually it becomes really the full energy source, and then it pops up into a fully convective red giant star. Right. Um, and in that scenario, it's not a normal red giant star. It's actually to the red of the red giant branch known as a red straggler. Right. And then the mm -hmm. physics become a bit uncertain at that point, but eventually you leave behind a, a black hole with a little bit, uh, certainly a little bit less mass than the present sun. So this would be uh, an origin channel for subsolar mass uh, black holes. Right. Um, and then what, what we also mentioned in the abstract is that we look at not only uh, the solar mass, but also different um, masses and different metallicities. Cool. Um, and then uh, we point out that um, that there might be a route to discovering these objects um, through astroseismology, through the way that they pulsate. Okay. And then we, we, we point out that we list several um, open problems and uh, as well as our predictions. Super, awesome. Yeah, so um, with that in mind, I think it'd be good for Matt to talk a bit about um, dark matter in general and PVHs in particular. Yeah, that's great. And maybe we'll we'll also jump ahead a little bit to sure. the accretion scheme too. So obviously if primordial black holes exist, you would want to know, you'd want to be able to detect them. Maybe some of the LIGO merging black holes are PBHs, maybe the supermassive black holes are PBHs. We don't really know. And right now it's been a game of how not to build a light bulb 
where every measurement and observation that's made is really just a constraint saying, yeah, they can't be here. They can't be of this mass. They can't be of this abundance. Yeah. But there is this unconstrained asteroid mass window. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's kind of funky because these things at 10 to the 17 grams or so have angstrom scale Schwarzschild radii. And so you take these estimates and these these tools that you learn in your astrophysics course to try and determine how fast they grow, how bright the accretion luminosity is. And you start scratching your head and you go, well, wait a minute, am I in the continuum limit? Does this still hold? And so I'm starting with this, this piece of, of maybe insecurity to say to, to both you, Frank, and the astute listener, that what I'm about to describe is not the end all be all of microscopic black hole accretion in stars. And really, this is a first model that Good. was possible to be implemented in MESA because right. you run up against really hard numeric limits with the accretion rates and luminosities and, and smoothing these boundaries at the Bondi sphere. And so before I even introduce any of this, I just want to start that, that Earl worked really hard to make the new MESA capabilities. And he put up with a lot of crap from me and from everyone else to come up with a good accretion scheme. And we did the best we could, and we want to do better in future work. So I just want to start by saying that. So Frank, let's suppose that you are a microscopic black hole in the center of a star. How fast do you grow? Well, you're going to create at the Bondi rate Presumably, yes. which is just the sound speed limited rate that matter can sort of fall in where the black hole's gravity is going to dominate over the other pressure in the fluid. But right. this is also probably going to be a, a really big overestimate of your accretion rate because it's going to apply, imply, I mean, a very high accretion luminosity. Mm -hmm. And as we know, luminosity mm -hmm. tends to drive down accretion rates. So a lot of other papers have talked about, oh, well, the survival of stars constrains primordial black holes as dark matter because if they're captured by stars, they destroy them really quickly. And I don't want to like go picking fights with other papers and start right. like really yeah, jazz. Yeah. But, but this is the textbook go-to estimate. You say, oh, it accretes yeah. at the Bondi rate. And that is probably too big. And this was one of the first things that we realized when we looked at the quasi-star literature and we were in touch with Warwick Ball, that the accretion rate's much lower, meaning they live a lot longer than your intuition from astrophysics is going to, to make you expect. Right. So at first, there is this uh, convectively limited Bondi regime where matter is falling in, but it's not quite at the Bondi rate. It's suppressed by one or two orders of magnitude because yeah. of the really high accretion luminosity. And yeah. we don't have a good handle on the radiative efficiency. So we took that to be about 8% because that's mm -hmm. kind of standard. But that's also another knob. That's yet another knob that we have to turn. We have to think about with the rotation of the star and the black hole. Mm -hmm. But this right. gives us the, the Bondi convective, uh, or it gives us the luminosity of the black hole which it will shine at and produce a convective cell around the black hole. Okay. And so this convective cell can then only feed the black hole so quickly before it would overheat and shocks would, uh, would shut it off. Okay. So there's a convective limit on one end. But as the black hole grows larger, the luminosity presumably grows larger. Maybe it can enter an Eddington limited regime where mm. the black hole luminosity itself provides a radiation pressure to push back against the infalling matter. And that would stall the accretion even farther. So these are the sort of two major accretion schemes that we consider. That's equation three and equation four for the uh -huh. Eddington luminosity and then the um, convectively limited Bondi luminosity. And yep. it's really important to remember that all of this also depends on the star in real time. So the Eddington luminosity depends on the opacity, which is going to depend on the metallicity of the star. And that could vary through cosmic time if we're thinking about stars other than the sun. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the Bondi uh, rate is going to depend on uh, the density. And that, of course, depends on the evolution of the star as well. So getting all of these things into a realistic MESA model is, uh, it's a first, and it's fantastic that we're able to do this and do more than just analytic estimates. And I will shout out Earl yet again, he has made this publicly available. So if you are interested in popping one of these off the shelf and running it, you can reproduce, I think, the plots that we're about to show you of, of the growth. And so I think Earl wants to show you those plots. Oh, yeah, sure thing. Got to so, got to um, love that GitHub uh, repo name, Black Hole Sun. It's got to remind <laughs> me of something. <laughs> we'll leave that alone for now. Onwards. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so yeah, maybe maybe it's a good idea to hop right to Figure One then. Sure. Um, 
So in figure one, um, we first show in the top uh, panels the normal evolution of the sun. So this is a so-called Kippenhahn diagram uh, named in honor of uh, the Rudolph. former director of Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. Um, and for those of you who don't work every day in uh, stellar physics, this is a typical way to visualize the evolution of a star. So on the x-axis, you have the age of the star. And on the y-axis, you either have the mass coordinate in the case of uh, the left panel or the radial coordinate in the case of the right panel. And so each vertical slice is showing you the structure of the star at a given age. Yes. And so, yeah, uh, the innermost um, several percent, um, maybe 30% of the sun by mass is fusing hydrogen into helium. And it's, it's been doing that for the past four and a half billion years. And it'll continue to do that for another uh, about equal amount of time. Um, and eventually it's going to um, exhaust its central hydrogen fuel supply and it'll leave behind an inert helium core. So that's the yellow region on this diagram. Yes. And when that happens, it will continue fusing hydrogen in a shell above that, uh, above that uh, helium core. And then the outer layers will become uh, convective and the, those layers will deepen. Actually, the outer layers are convective even presently. In terms of mass, it's, it's mm -hmm. a very little amount, but in terms of radius, the present sun is about 30% uh, by radius. The outer 30% is convective. Right. And then that will deepen considerably once it, once it evolves. Um, and turns into a subgiant and then a red giant star. Cool. You can also see on the right panel uh, the radius of the sun, like uh, how large the sun is. So that that thick black line is indicating the photosphere exactly. And so you can see right. how it was smaller in the past. It reaches its present radius of one solar radii, and then um, it, it'll expand dramatically, um, potentially uh, engulfing the Earth. Um, yes. The situation is quite different if you put a black hole inside the sun. Okay. So that's that's what the bottom panels show. Okay. So here we have a very modest uh, sized black hole. Uh, it has 10 to the power negative 11 solar masses. So that's like roughly um, asteroid mass range or maybe sublunar mass range. And so here, here's our basic scenario. Um, one, one thing that uh, is important to mention is like how such an object could have gotten there in the first place. Yeah. Um, we don't think that it's likely that the sun as it is would absorb a primordial black hole. With typical velocities, a typical black hole, a primordial black hole would just pass through the sun like a bullet. Right. It would excite um, transient oscillations. Uh, Siobhan Hansaj has an interesting article about um, what those oscillations might look like and if we could detect them, similar to Matt's um, lunar crater uh, paper. Ah. Instead, what we think is that if you have a star forming region that's contracting, uh, there you have the chance to capture one of the uh, a primordial black hole that's in the slow tail of the distribution. Uh -huh. And so we're imagining that when the sun um, formed, it would have formed about a primordial black hole. And later on, we have some estimates of the in spiral time and things like that. And okay. so we're imagining in this, in this model, uh, a 10 to the power of negative 11 uh, solar mass black hole already at the center of the sun um, when, when the sun begins its life. And so what you can immediately see is that uh, you drive the layers outside of this black hole to be convective. Now, this is a very small amount of mass, but yeah. you're mixing the innermost, you know, very tiny percent of the sun around the black hole. And that's because even at this small mass, as it accretes, it, it um, outflows luminosity. And that, that luminosity, if you have um, energy coming out of your central point, that will always drive convection in your models. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, you have this really tiny convective core about the black hole. Um, initially, the black hole grows slowly. Over the lifetime of the sun, it basically um, accretes about 10 times its mass. Mm -hmm. Yes. But then once you get to this sweet spot of about 10 to the minus 10, uh, 10 to the power negative 10 um, uh, solar masses, then you, you start to do runaway growth uh, of the black hole. Okay. And um, that's, that's corresponding to the transition between uh, Bondi uh, limited accretion and Eddington limited accretion. Okay. okay. Um, once you get to the, yeah? Did you want to say something? I'm good. Oh, okay. Once you get to this <clears throat> point about 10 to the minus four solar masses of your black hole, uh -huh. there you shut off fusion. Um, it's slightly more gradual than this figure indicates because I only use one color for fusion, but we can see it in more detail in the next figure. But what you see here is that fusion shuts off and you drive the entire 
rest of the envelope to become fully convective. And so at this stage, you have a fully convective star that's being totally supported by accretion onto the central black hole. Okay. And these objects would have unique observable characteristics, which we'll get to later. Okay. Um, and on the right panel, you see the same model, except now you can see the Schwarzschild radius and the Bondi radius of the star. So mm -hmm. initially, the Schwarzschild mm -hmm. radius is so small that it's not visible, even when I make this. Thanks things span like 14 orders of magnitude. Um, and then you, you can also see the Bondi radius um, throughout. Mm -hmm. And the Bondi radius is what we take as the inner boundary condition of our model. So actually, that's that's maybe a fun point for um, people who are interested in the, uh, the real details, which is that in order to model these objects in MESA, um, we play a trick that was actually introduced by Donald Clayton, very clever idea, which is that we replace the inner boundary conditions of our stellar evolution model uh, with a model for the accretion uh, of, of the black hole. So okay. instead of saying that at a mass of zero, you have luminosity zero, radius zero, density zero, et cetera, right. uh, not density zero, uh, uh, <laughs> mass radius and luminosity zero, we replace them by the mass of the black hole, the Bondi radius, and then the associated luminosity uh, of the accretion onto that object. Okay. And so with those ingredients, we then model the growth of the black hole and we take away that mass from, from the star. Yeah, I'll, I'll also add to that. It introduces uh, a really interesting crash condition to the code because an obvious question is like, well, hey, well, what about the, the late post main sequence when the black hole is finishing gobbling it up and when it's nearly a solar mass? Mm -hmm. What sort of X-ray transient might you expect? And Maze is not predicting that for us because when the Bondi radius hits the surface of the star, mm -hmm. there isn't so much a star in the model anymore. Right. So this was a question we got a lot was about the, the post-main sequence. And yeah. I'll also add one other thought to these panels, especially the one on the bottom right. Uh, you notice that after this rapid growth that quenches the fusion, yes. there has been a very gradual growth of the black hole. And this is, again, one of those points that I mentioned is that our accretion model is dynamic. It's responding to changes in the opacity and especially changes in the density and sound speed at the core. And once the luminosity from the black hole is now multiple solar luminosities, the density drops. It is really pushing back and puffing the star up. Yeah. And so this stalls the accretion, giving you that five, six, seven giga years of extended sub sub giant red straggler growth. Wow. And that is something that is sort of obvious in retrospect, but we definitely didn't predict it. It just sort of came out of the models naturally. And then we looked at it and said, wow, this is potentially observable. If yeah. these things exist, this is a really long lived phase that's in an otherwise sparse part of the HR diagram. Yes, yes, very cool. Yeah, nothing about this was obvious to me <laughs> at the outset. It was basically, uh, <laughs> The continual um, discovery after discovery in this um, interesting space of uh, possibility. Um, so even you know, even if it turns out not to be real or anything, it was still we're still grappling with really interesting physics. You know, there's this quote like, "If it's wrong, it's interesting and wrong." So that's that's how I've <laughs> felt about this. Uh, yeah, well, you know, when you're doing something for the first time, there's lots of things to discover and talk about, and they may not all be perfect, and it's just great. It's awesome. That's right, yeah. And that's also why um, I like to continually re-emphasize our uncertainty with respect to so many different aspects of this problem. Yeah. I mean, at every turn, there's some level of uncertainty. Um, but we do the best we can with what we've got and be honest about the parts that we're not sure about and then open the door for future exploration. And yeah. that's that's been a wonderful way of working on this. Cool, very nice. Okay, so onwards. Perhaps that should bring us to figure two. Um, okay, what we got yeah. here? Luminosity age, light curves. Yes, yeah, so here we're tracking the, the different um, sources of luminosity inside the model. And so in the left panel, you have the normal evolution of the sun. Um, it, yeah, so the... Yes. The, the gray outline tells you what the actual luminosity is. The red part tells you how much of that luminosity is coming from nuclear fusion. Yes. And the uh, black dashed lines tell you about our present sun. So the vertical one tells you the current age of the sun, and the horizontal one tells you the current luminosity of the sun. So, of course, in the past, the sun was less bright, it has its current brightness, and then it, it, gets, it turns into a red giant. Um, 
And, and, then, mm -hmm. and then once you put a black hole inside, we introduce an additional black line that shows you how much luminosity is coming from the accretion onto the black hole. And so initially, you have the same scenario as the sun. The luminosity from the black hole is negligible. You're getting all of your energy from fusion. Yes. But once the accretion luminosity starts to increase, you see the fusion luminosity going down dramatically. Uh -huh. That's because you have these layers being pushed out a bit. Their temperature cools down. And well, you're getting energy from another source. So you, you uh -huh. don't need it from, from fusion. And so you see the gradual uh, shutting off of nuclear fusion. You see the dimming of the sun here. So you can see the, the, the gray mm. highlight is showing uh -huh. you what the actual luminosity is. So that's, that's the sun dimming over 100 mega years and uh -huh. then rebrightening again as it turns into one of these red straggler stars. Now um, prediction. Yeah, exactly. And you can also see in this figure the masses uh, of the black hole. So I pointed out this mass of 10 to the minus four solar masses. That's that's when you start to really become a black hole uh, dominated. accretion dominated uh, yeah. object. And okay. then the right panel says what would have happened if the sun was born about a black hole with 10 to the minus 10 solar masses. And this is clearly incompatible with our everyday experience because the sun would have already puffed up into a giant star. Ooh, yes. Mm -hmm. putting, yeah, several times the current uh, solar luminosity. So we nice. know from this that the sun could not have been born about um, such such a black hole. Uh, yeah. if, if one's in there, which is unlikely, um, it would it would have to be less massive than this at its, at its birth. Good, good. All right, a limit. Very nice. Very cool. Um, and I think, oh yeah, there's a nice little Easter egg in here, which is that when you print this out on standard size paper, then the 10 to the minus uh, six solar mass black hole in the middle panel, it, there's not actually text on it, but the lowest dot there, that yeah. one, yeah. that's its actual size. That's, that's its <laughs> real size in real life. So that's how... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Thank you for appreciating that. That's, that's how large that thing that thing would be inside the sun, and nevertheless supplying this enormous luminosity. Yeah, that's right here, people. Very cool. Very cool. Easter egg. All right. We had a bit of fun. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> I think those scientific editors need to pay a little more attention. <laughs> we could spend the entire hour just showing you the different Easter eggs that we had <laughs> hidden in this paper mm. and slipped past. Uh, the reviewer and the editor, but maybe I shouldn't admit to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Little mark here, check next manuscript. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to get blacklisted from uh, that. Okay. Cool. <laughs> all right. Onward. No, they're all, of course, um, good Easter eggs with scientific merit. Yeah, yeah. Um, the good one right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Um, perhaps we should then go on to the next figure. Okay, still our models, we set this up, and we have an HR diagram. Right, exactly. So then we started thinking about what happens when you change um, the, the mass of these, these black holes, and what, how does that actually affect the evolution in the HR diagram? Not just what happens to the structure of the star, but what are the outward appearances of these objects? Okay. So if you follow the black line, okay. the black line shows you the evolution of the normal sun. So the uh, the the initial point tells you the zero age main sequence. So that's like the birth of the sun. And yep. then that black point tells you the present position of the sun. So it has its current effective temperature and current luminosity. Eventually yep. the sun will uh, exhaust its hydrogen fuel supply and turn into a subgiant and then a red giant. And that this line turns uh, dotted once yep. there's central hydrogen exhaustion. So that's mm. the normal evolution of the sun. Indeed looks, and, yep. Looks normal, yeah. <laughs> And um, then uh, when we put in black holes of various masses inside the sun, the evolution of course changes. And um, the more massive the, the black hole, the earlier in the evolution it changes. And so the most um, massive one we consider here is this uh, 10 to the minus four solar mass, which is way off on the right hand side of this diagram. The sun Ooh. doesn't even enter its normal main sequence oh, evolution. Right. But if you put a, 10 to the minus 10 solar mass uh, black hole in there, then you get this orange line. The sun will live its normal life for like 2 billion years. Okay. And then it will, it will actually evolve to the right. So the starting point is still this black line, this black dot, the Zams line, but yeah. it, it then quickly 
veers off to the right. And it does, like we said, it dims and then it brightens. And yes. uh, this 10 to the minus 11 solar mass black hole scenario, that could still be our present sun. Probably isn't, but could be our present sun. So today, the sun would look the same, but in a bit of time, it would then start this dimming. Mm -hmm. and what's interesting is that these tracks then go off uh, over here um, on the right-hand side, and they grow to the red of the red giant branch. And this is where um, interesting stars that live here are called red stragglers. And mm -hmm. whenever you look in color magnitude diagrams of stellar clusters, you always see like a couple of these objects. And so, um, yeah, uh, Emily Liner has actually cataloged a bunch of these. Uh, oh, okay. She's found about uh, 500 uh, red stragglers uh, throughout the Gaia data and throughout um, so the Gaia data of field stars. So she's found field uh, red stragglers. And then there's also a bunch in, um, in clusters that she's discovered. And so um, these are our promising targets because yes. um, this is one pathway to put a star in that position of the HR diagram where normal stellar evolution tracks uh, don't bring you, certainly not in a long-lived phase. Whereas here you can see with this adopted accretion model, the star is living for billions and billions of years in this position. Right. So, so what's interesting, I think what's interesting is that, um, I okay, well, there's, there's one thing we didn't mention in the beginning, which is, of course, um, one of Hawking's most important contributions is evaporation of black holes. Right, yep. and um, it turns out that the evaporation limit in terms of solar units is about ten to the minus twenty solar masses. Yes. So anything less massive than ten to the minus twenty solar masses would have evaporated by the time the solar system formed. Mm -hmm. Anything more massive than that is still fair game to exist in the present universe. Yes. Okay. Now we're looking at ten to the minus ten solar masses, right? So that's ten orders of magnitude of black hole masses that could have been born in the black hole. But born in the Big Bang and exists to the present day. And so yeah. if those things are out there and if some of them get captured inside stars and it changes their evolution, this is where those, those stars would end up on the HR diagram and potentially live for billions of years in that position. Wow. And so that's sort of like, I think, um, one of the real big take-home points of this is that if this is really the solution to the dark matter problem, if these things are really out there, then we have a detector. Most yeah. of the dark matter will, of course, be out there in the universe, not inside of stars. Some tiny fraction might make their way inside of stars. And if they do, this is a way to find them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, I think Earl has really hit the key point. I think this figure, even more than the Kippenhans, is, is the outlook and is the story that we want to tell. So the sun is probably not a Hawking star or this cute name we've given to these stars with black holes. But order of magnitude estimates for the capture rates tell you that there should be a few thousand probably in the Milky Way. And when you move to environments with lower velocity dispersions, meaning ultra faint dwarfs, yeah. meaning globular yeah. clusters, these other environments, the right. capture rate is going to be much higher. So these are really, this is prime real estate to go looking for, for these objects. Because again, we're finding a way not to build a light bulb. If we can look at all these red stragglers and say, hey, yeah, all of them look normal and they don't have enhanced helium from becoming fully convective and mixing their cores away or having weird astro seismology. If we can do this observationally, then we can maybe put a constraint on this remaining window where primordial black holes could be dark matter. Or maybe we're actually gonna find one and it's gonna be the biggest thing since sliced bread. I wouldn't put money on it, but this is why we do science, right? We actually have to check. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Very. That's right. And and Matt raised um, an important point there, which is that these objects would very likely have unique astroseismic characteristics. Yeah. So a normal red giant star um, has a stratified core, right? Nuclear fusion has produced the chemical composition gradient and is a radiative core, right? Um, and so what that means is that, well, I, I hope I don't use too much jargon for those of you who aren't astro seismologists out there, but there's basically two types of pulsations that we look at in stars. P modes, modes which are restored by pressure, and G modes, which are restored by buoyancy or, or, or gravity. And um, in uh, a red giant star, the frequencies of the G mode pulsations are of order the frequencies of P mode pulsations. And so they couple together to form coupled oscillations. 
Yes. And so when we look at Red Giant Stars, one of the one of the great achievements of things like the Kepler mission, the TESS mission, uh, the Corot mission, and other related astroseismic uh, missions um, was the discovery of these mixed oscillation modes in basically every red giant that we look at. Yep. At least, you know, the low mass ones that, that um, we're interested in here. Um, so every single one of these, we see this dense forest of mixed oscillation modes. But because these objects, as, as uh, Matt mentioned, we're suggesting the name Hawking Star in, in honor of Stephen Hawking. Um, uh, in, in a Hawking star, because you don't have this stratified interior, because the envelope is fully convective, right. there's no way for you to host uh, G-mode pulsations, and right. therefore, there's nothing for the P-modes to couple with. And so uh, you see pure P-mode oscillations, which are evenly spaced according to uh, the mean density of the star. And sure. so, yeah, you would, you would just see equally spaced acoustic peaks in the power spectrum of one of these objects, unlike the dense forest of mixed oscillation modes in a normal red giant star. So our, basically our, our detector is looking for a red straggler that has pure acoustic oscillations. Right. Yep. I, I, I can't think of another scenario that would make a star look like this. There's other scenarios that give you a red straggler. Yeah. There's other scenarios that give True. you a uh, pure acoustic oscillation, but there's not other scenarios that give you both at the same time. Not one that I've heard of. Of course, uh, that doesn't mean it's impossible, but you know, there's not another model so far. Now, that, that gives us a target. We can go out and look for um, data yep. of these things and yep. see if that's what they, they are. Um, so that, that would be something for the future. Nice, very cool. Even got observable signatures, I love it. Okay, onwards. Thank I think you. We've got one more. This is a pretty one. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hey, Frank, can I ask you a, a quick question? Sure. I don't know if I can answer it, but go. So, so first, do you have a background in theater or acting? Because no, you you do a great job of still being a character <laughs> in the in the stage play that is these journal clubs uh, with your cup of coffee. You speak with your hands. I, I wish I could do that. Um, I have a second question for you, which is, does this plot look like any other design that you've seen in the wild? Like, what's your first reflex? Like, what does this visually remind you of? This plot? Yeah. Does it remind you of a logo? A can of soda that you might see from time to time? <laughs> if I stretch my eyes, yeah. <laughs> so, Matt's making fun of my color scheme. <laughs> so I love this color scheme. I'm not making fun of Earl at all. But Earl hates that I call this the Pepsi plot, yeah. and he's going to hate that I just committed that to the public record by calling it that <laughs> in this in this recording. Oh, but we, we have editing. <laughs> we we did we we call this the Pepsi plot, and what it's showing us is the expected lifetime of stars of different masses as a function of the seed black hole mass. So the entire paper up to this point right. was stellar evolution models of the sun right. adding black hole in. But there are a lot of knobs you can tune, like say metallicity, the mass of the star, the PBH mass. And we want to know how long stars of these different masses will survive given their seed masses. And we've expressed it as a percentage of their main sequence lifetime. Okay. So they can either prematurely discontinue their main sequence and then swell or right. they can reach the end of their main sequence. And believe it or not, the core contraction drives the density up so high and drives the conductivity so high that they basically immediately transition to this, this subgiant phase because huh. the accretion luminosity yeah. and the accretion yeah. rate just, just push so much mass into the black hole so quickly. So this is sort of a way of estimating how long some of these stars are going to live. And you see that for a pretty wide range of, uh, you know, especially stars that are more massive than the sun, uh, they can live their entire main sequence life with a black hole in the core. And the lower mass stars then give you this also really interesting potential to use them as a detector. If you see these subsolar mass uh, black holes, potentially, uh, you can use them to constrain uh, the capture rate in these lower mass. I'm gonna let Earl talk a little bit about this, this too, because that's just sort of the, the quirk ideas of the plot, but he's got more to say. Okay. Sure thing. Yeah. So first of all, I, I want to give a lot of credit here to both Matt and the third author, um, Teo Rayu. Initially, when I was doing this, I wanted to do everything um, through simulation, right? Simu just putting it into Mesa, crunching the numbers and seeing what happens. But when you want to consider a lot of masses, a lot of um, black hole masses, and we also made this diagram for different metallicities and so on, 
then you're running a, a huge number of simulations and you need to babysit all of them. And so we started to wonder if we could do the, this analytically. And these, these two guys showed me um, how we can do the calculation analytically. And I thought it was brilliant. So, um, and that's actually um, almost all of the appendix is dedicated to how we um, work this out uh, analytically. So this, these are analytic accretion estimates for the lifetimes of uh, main sequence stars born harboring a primordial black hole. And so with the color bar, yeah? Yeah, I just had a question. <clears throat> Since you mentioned multiple metallicities here, is this for is this figure for one metallicity or is there yeah, actually this separate is that solar metallicity? metallicity. Okay, solar. Exactly. Yeah, so um, in the appendix, we explore other metallicities. And then uh, we have privately made a bunch of different versions of this diagram with different metallicities and different constraints, but I don't think we included anything else in this work. I think we've okay. held it off for future. Um, because the article started getting quite long. Um, everyone who we talked to about this got really excited about a different aspect of it. And sure. then we started like accreting at the Bondi rate, different details. <laughs> different <laughs> ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So the color bar tells you uh, your main sequence lifetime. And it's, in it's a percentage in terms of your normal main sequence lifetime without if you were born without a black hole. Correct. Yep. So the red region tells you you live your whole life as normal, right? Even if you were born about a black hole, you still get through your entire main sequence. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell you about what happens afterwards, but uh, it tells you about if you if you survive the main sequence phase. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, there's some obvious things like if you put in a massive black hole um, inside a low mass star, then it eats it up really fast. <laughs> um, if you put in a really low mass black hole inside any mass star, then the, the stars live their whole lives. So like, mm -hmm. if you're down at 10 to the minus 13 solar masses, uh, black hole, you can go inside of any star and yeah. that star will survive the main sequence, yes. so, which I, I found quite interesting. And mm -hmm. um, that was certainly not intuitive to me when I first started working on that. I think that's, I think that's one detail that um, everyone would agree with, actually. That, that's not really a particular um, dependency on our accretion model. If you ask basically anyone who works on black holes, they would say, yeah, um, these low mass black holes, and this is seven orders of magnitude above the Hawking evaporation limit, Right. Those things would not change um, the evolution of uh, of a main sequence star of any mass. The, yeah. the, the the star would just not even notice it. I mean, it's smaller than like a proton, and it can't double its mass even over the lifetime of the universe. Right. Um, this first um, dashed or, uh, white line tells us between tells us about the transition from the Bondi accretion rate to the Eddington accretion rate, yep. and that's where the physics becomes much more uncertain and where we've explored sure. different accretion models. And so this shows one accretion model where we transitioned from Bondi to Eddington, but we also explored pure Bondi accretion. And that actually led a follow-up paper in which um, we explored even more uh, uh, possibilities in, in accretion. Okay. It is um, also available on the archive and it has just been accepted and we're studying photon trapping in it. So it has a dynamic radiative efficiency set of the constant radiative efficiency here. So we are making progress. Cool. That's right. Yeah. And I'll point out that uh, it has a really great uh, title and abstract. The title is, is there a black hole inside the sun? And the first sentence is, there's probably not a black hole inside of the sun. So, <laughs> oh, um, I love the balance. I love the balance. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. And then um, what you can see in this diagram are contours of age. And so you yes. see like, um, you know, one giga year, 10 giga years, 100 mega years, and so on. This yeah. is uh, basically how long, uh, th these are just times, right? Uh -huh. And you can see when uh -huh. the black hole starts to take over. So what I like to focus on in this diagram is the white band kind of running through the middle, because that right. tells you precisely um, what kinds of stars are good detectors for what kinds of primordial black holes. Yeah. Because if you put a black hole inside a star of that mass with that black hole mass, then the star will have half its life as normal. And then it will become one of these Hawking stars. Right. It'll go off, become a red straggler. Right. And so, yeah, the, the, this was an immensely helpful figure to make because it also showed us where we should focus on um, running our simulations because it tells us where, where the sweet spots are. I, I spent <laughs> many fruitless months running lots of different black hole masses without this as a guide. And as soon as I made this diagram, uh, ah. it really illuminated, okay, where should we actually run the simulations? Right. And I actually, 
I didn't include it, but I actually validated this diagram uh, numerically. So at least for the solar mass track, it, it lines up perfectly. The accretion, the analytic accretion estimates are extremely okay. accurate for the solar for the solar mass. For, Sometimes for analytics is pretty good, huh? Yeah. yeah it, well, <laughs> it does all just follow from main sequence scaling laws. Like the main sequence is so constant that yeah. you can just plug that right into those relations for the accretion rate and luminosity. Okay. And it, it does great. Nice, nice. Plus, sometimes analytics give you some fuzzy, warm feeling that you actually understand what's going on with the physics. <laughs> That's so, right. <laughs> cool. Very good. Very good. Okay. okay. So on now maybe we should get to the open problems. Um, okay. And maybe we can trade off talking about um, some of them. Uh, so maybe I can talk about the first one a little bit. Um, okay. This is an important one, uh, which is uh, the initial mass function of primordial black holes. Now, I think this is the area where we have probably the largest number of misconceptions from other people who look at this. Because okay. a lot of people who I talk to, they'll say, primordial black holes, those have already been ruled out as a dark matter candidate. And that's not true. Um, the reason why people think that is because there's been many studies that investigate primordial black holes as dark matter, assuming a so-called monochromatic mass function, yeah. which is a fancy way of saying that they assume all of the uh, black holes have exactly the same mass. Right. In wow. other words, the initial mass function is a is delta function, right? It's just, you know, they're all asteroid mass or they're all lunar mass, something like that. Right. In reality, um, if you look at cosmological models of uh, primordial black hole formation, you you form a really broad spectrum of initial masses. There's a great review article that we point to by um, uh, by Bernard Carr and uh, collaborators. It's the last thing um, in this section. Ah, here we go. Uh, Carr Carr et al. 2023. Yes. And their figure 38, they show an initial mass function for primordial black holes, and indeed it spans the full gamut. It, okay. Extremely low mass objects extremely high, high mass objects. So the thing that I, so um, I, I remain agnostic, I think as a person should to the existence of these things, but sure. my understanding from talking to um, cosmologists and people who know more about this topic than I do is that um, people doubt, the people who look into this seriously, uh, they, they have their doubts about whether or not these primordial black holes could account for all of the dark matter but many of them think that probably some exist. Okay. So like the scale of the initial mass function is not yeah, yeah. really known, sure. but there is this really broad initial mass function. And a lot of people consider it probable that at least some black holes uh, came out of the Big Bang. Okay. So that actually makes our scenario alive, even if they, they don't account for all of the dark matter. E even if you have some, the, this scenario could happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm also just gonna agree with Earl. I don't want to come off as a true believer or that we're here to proselytize for primordial black holes. Uh, I would both be surprised if they did exist and unsurprised if they if they did exist. Like I, I'm I'm truly agnostic, but I am excited about them is, is what I am. It's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very good. Do you want to take the next open problem, Matt? Yeah, right. I'll talk about capture rates for 30 seconds. So okay. this is the big question that a lot of people come to us with. They say, well, if you can't get a black hole into the star to begin with, then who cares? Right. And so this is really beyond the scope of our work because this is a question of mm -hmm. dynamical friction and orbital interactions and n-body problems with these like adiabatic contracting clouds. And I just want to give a shout out to there is... Um, uh, a group in, I think it's Brussels, it's Esser and Tinyakov have been publishing papers recently, and they're showing that these capture rates are enormous in ultrafaint dwarfs and globular clusters. But you can also use them to get estimates, for example, in the Milky Way, and you can very rough order of magnitude estimate that a sun-like star in the Milky Way has a 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 7-ish capture rate. And yeah, so the sun is not a hawking star, but part per million or Probably. 10 million in the disk suddenly means thousands in the Milky Way potentially. Right. By right. So yeah, it's it's small. Like it's it's amazingly small. You, you don't have to worry about one really destroying the solar system, but it is large enough to be astrophysically interesting is really the main point there. And so that 10 to the minus six was a cross-section? No, that's a capture rate. 
Capture rate. Okay, gotcha. It's got the cross yeah. section folded in. Okay. Yeah, and that also we can even skip the next section about can the PBH reach the stellar core in a stellar lifetime because that's actually accounted for in the Esser and Tinyakov estimates as they include ah, that. They say okay. if it's in the star, it's definitely getting to the core. So sure. really, this whole section right here is is not even that important. But the next one about the growth rate and radiative efficiency is hard because that becomes a general relativity problem. That becomes a question about the rotation of stars and differential rotation of the core because it's really the core matter that's coupling to the black hole growth. So yeah. these are really, I think, where the open questions are for improving our accretion scheme is how can we get a more accurate model that, that also connects the gas pressure in the core and the rotation of the gas and, and have a more dynamic radiative efficiency rather than just saying, here's 0.08 from the... Yeah, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Cool. And there's yeah, what else? Is there anything else you wanted to volunteer, Earl, for any of these later sections? Because a lot of these problems I think we've we've talked about already. Like, what is the transient afterwards? We don't know. Somebody mm -hmm. else has to figure that out. Okay. Right. Very yeah, cool. very interesting problem. Post main sequence, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's got a lot of... Uh... Open threads. <laughs> what All right. Consequence? Oh, I'm going to save that. I'm going to save this one. I'm going to save this one. So, sure all right. Um, and I do encourage people to check out the two appendices. They're really great. Uh, first one is on some XAM models. And on the second one is some of the analytics that were part of that uh, figure four plot. So do check that out if you get a chance. And Matt and Earl, I want to thank you so much for walking us through this very thought-provoking article. APJ, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, happy to be here. This is a blast. Yeah, yeah. it's a real pleasure. And you mentioned it a little bit uh, uh, toward the end, and I'm going to push on a little bit because we want to end on a happy future note there. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about some of the envision threads or possible threads that would happen, on, let's say, post-main sequence, okay, if the star is still surviving, right? Oop. Okay, there's there's sort of two questions in there. One is computational and one is observational. Uh, Earl, do you want to give an observational answer? Yeah, sure thing. So, I mean, one really exciting possibility that I think this first study enabled is trying to go out and find these things. And so we have predictions for what, what such an object would look like, uh, a so-called Hawking star, so-called by us. I don't know how much I can say so-called when I suggested the name. Wikipedia did make an article that says Hawking stars are these things that these two lunatics came up okay. with. So I think it's, it's a, I think it's a real term now. <laughs> okay. We're canonized. That's amazing. Well, as lunatics. Wow. Okay. We made it to Wikipedia. <laughs> that, that's what success looks like. Um, yeah. So um, I think a really exciting possibility is to look at the, the astroseismic data of red straggler stars and see whether they bear this characteristic. Now, mm -hmm. I will not be surprised when they don't, but um, you know, we, we don't know what forms red straggler stars. There's several formation channels. Yes. And so whatever it turns out to be, we stand to learn something important. And that's what I think is quite interesting about an observational search because um, it's really win-win. I mean, it's, it's very low risk and high reward. I mean, obviously the highest reward is if we solve dark matter, but that's not, you know, the realistic expectation. In reality, we might make really meaningful contributions to stellar physics and especially yeah. uh, binary physics because yeah. one, one route is through binary interactions to bring a star to this red straggler phase. Although of course we can keep our aspirations high that possibly they'll have this um, exotic signature. Mm -hmm. Good. And Matt? Yeah. And, and the, the post-main sequence is really interesting because I don't want to pretend that this paper has the final word on that. I emphasize that there's a lot of uncertainty in this accretion model, mostly because it's two, two guys popping open a textbook and just pulling the textbook equations. And we really do want to put more thought into how to handle rotation and these other effects and what a dynamic radiative efficiency could look like. That second paper that I just mentioned uh, has photon trapping in it. And we show that there can be these rapid direct collapses where almost as soon as it's hitting the Eddington limit, it's also eating the photons and the star just poofs out of the sky in a matter of you know years. So there's there's a lot of uncertainty there and we'd love to, to really improve our accretion scheme 
and do surveys of stellar masses, seed masses, rotation, metallicity. And this can be important even in the direct collapse case where there's no long postmate sequence. That can still be important for interpreting these ultra faint dwarfs and these globular clusters right. if they are dark matter dominated. Maybe their star has just got converted into black holes. So we have a lot of different directions to go just on the computational angle. There's so many knobs to turn and so many accretion models that we should test. Good, good. Nice thing about a good problem that it has lots of threads that one can play with as opposed to a one and done. So very good, <clears throat> awesome. Matt, Earl, thank you once again. Thank you so much, Frank. This was a lot of fun. This was a blast. Thanks, Frank. And that will do, everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.